which allows us to address these issues that we consider of critical concern here in Canada, but also more broadly, and where possible, we would like to put the Canadian context into an international experience, in particular, think about what we can learn from each other from a transatlantic comparative perspective, looking at Canada, Europe, also the rest of the world with respect to some of those key issues. Um, for today, you know, we thought we'd start off this uh, webinar series with an issue that is in particular burning here in BC, where we are in the midst of a referendum on electoral reform. Electoral reform, some would argue, is rather technical issue, um, one that might not spark so much passion and debate, but if you think about it, although it might be technical in nature, electoral reform goes to the very heart of what our democratic system is all about. It is about translating the will of the people, the sovereign people, into votes and subsequently appoint um, people into positions of power in government and thus hold them to account as well. And Although we discuss a lot about you know, the limitations and the possibilities for modern democracy, elections are still the mechanism that uh, we use primarily to understand the preference of citizens and the mechanisms of appointing a government. So electoral systems are about legitimacy, they're holding the government to account, and they're about the government ability, you know, the stability of government. If we look around uh, what is happening today, we could say we, there is um, a clear sense of crisis when it comes to engaging citizens in democratic practice. There is a real sense of disenchantment uh, of people looking at democracy and not feeling that they really have a say in it. Uh, people stay away uh, from the ballot booth um, and there is a widespread disinterest in the whole political democratic um, process. This is somewhat surprising, you know, for me, it's been around a bit longer, to think in the 1990s, um, after the collapse of communism, it seemed that liberal democracy, representative democracy, elections um, would be the norm and would spread around the world and it would be greatly endorsed uh, by citizens, in particular in those countries who have seen authoritarian rule. Um, this is not necessarily the case at the moment. The, the mood has changed. You know, we see the rise of authoritarian leaders who might be elected into government, but who have often a disdain for democratic practices and rules. Just think about Brazil uh, this weekend, and we see what this means for the future of Brazilian democracy. Um, and um, we see an, a troubling trend also in terms of younger people. Uh, there is clear evidence that peop uh, younger people feel not invested in democracy. Younger people have, uh, have stayed away from elections. And in this respect, electoral reform can also be seen as an attempt to make democracy more attractive, fairer, and give citizens a true sense of having a voice. And you know, if you think back at the electoral campaign in Canada in 2015, now Prime Minister Trudeau promised that uh, Canada would vote with the first-past-the-post system for the last time. He, he clearly has stepped back from this promise, but we have different uh, uh, attempts at provincial level to think about what the fairest, best, and more, most effective electoral system could be um, across the country. Now, I'm very delighted and uh, grateful for being joined by two eminent experts um, on electoral reform uh, in the country. Before I come to them and introduce them, let me go over some administrative or housekeeping rules. The first one is, you know, uh, as I said, this is the first of our webinars. If there are some technological glitches, forgive us. You know, we are new to this, but, you know, I think we will learn and hopefully uh, you have a good experience in terms of the platform that we use. Um, all your listeners, we have muted you, so you can't directly interact with us by using your audio. Uh, that would create quite a bit of, um, of noise and uh, that wouldn't be helpful. However, what we do, after the two presentations, which will last about 10 to 15 minutes, 
bring you in through the chat box that you see now down there. You can raise your questions also throughout the presentations or, you know, sorry, after the presentations, you can type in your uh, questions and then we will address it. I will moderate and present it to our two experts. Um, the, there's also the possibility later on to present yourself. Um, if you don't have a question but just uh, want to interact, you know, you can use the chat box um, as well to create a sense of a community. Um, we'll see whether, you know, the video at the moment works well. We might uh, switch to audio if necessary, but I think for the moment uh, the technology is on our side. So let me now come to our first um, speaker, uh, which is Dennis uh, Pilon. Uh, sorry, the, the other way around there with the names, but you know, here we go. Dennis Pilon, you will see his face in a second. Dennis Pilon uh, received his BA and his MA from Simon Fraser and his PhD from York University. From 2006 to 2011, he was an assistant professor here at the University of Victoria. And very sad to see him go and take up a position at Political Science Department at York University as an associate professor, where he still works. Um, Dennis Pilon's research has focused primarily on issues of democratization, democratic reforms in Western countries, both in contemporary and historic perspective. In 2007, he published The Politics of Voting Reform, Canada's Electoral System, so very pertinent to our discussion today. And in 2009, he co-edited British Columbia Politics and Government. And lastly, as you see here on the PowerPoint presentation, he published the 2013 book, Wrestling with Democracy, Voting Systems and Politics in the 21st Century. Um, in addition um, to this, over the past decades, uh, Professor Pilon has done considerable public uh, speaking and media work covering many aspects of politics with reporters in print, uh, radio, TV, but also new uh, media. He has been quite prolific commenting on BC politics when he was here and has continued his work in various different dimensions of modern politics and democracy. He is presently a member of the National Advisory Board of Fair Vote Canada and a member of the editorial board of Canadian Dimension magazine. And he has also acted in various capacity as a consultant um, on electoral reforms, as you can see here on, the, uh, uh, on our uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentation. So at this stage, I would like to bring in Dennis. And you know, we're going to switch over, uh, enable his camera and audio. And I'm going to retreat into the Ethernet background uh, for a little moment. Hello there. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I am. You can. Excellent. All right. I just want to make sure that uh, everything's working. I am going to start my timer. Uh, okay. Well, let me begin. Uh, I got a lot of stuff that I wanted to try to run over in terms of drawing out lessons from around the world. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, claims being made. Uh, in the media on both sides, on both the pro and con sides of changing BC's voting system. But uh, how much of this can be backed up by comparative research, uh, looking at countries that are comparable to Canada? Uh, so in other, in other words, Western countries uh, that have had a similar economic and democratic development. To what extent uh, in looking at those countries can we draw out evidence that might be useful um, in terms of this debate that's going on in British Columbia right now? So with that in mind, these are the themes that I wanted to draw your attention to. And of course, with just 15 minutes, I won't be able to go into a great deal of detail about any of them. I'll probably just be you know, flashing through these. But the idea is that by presenting them uh, in the question and answers, if you want to come back to any of those uh, issues, we can do that. So let me begin with representation, because one of the claims that the uh, pro-change uh, forces make is that they want to make every vote count, that they want a more accurate representation of, the, of what voters say with their votes. Uh, and so I guess, you know, a key question is, is that a true claim? Can that be backed up by evidence? Uh, and certainly, when we look at the disproportionality of electoral outcomes, uh, so in other words, we look at the gap between what voters have said and what seats their parties won, uh, we certainly can see a stark difference between countries that use uh, majority voting systems, uh, first past the post or, or, or runoff system, and the varieties of proportional representation. As you can see, as the, as the bars on the graph get smaller, the proportional results are, are more proportional. So the gap between the votes and the seats is smaller. 
Another way uh, that we could look is to look at a recent election result in New Zealand. Uh, so we've looked at a, a general uh, uh, example, now a specific result. And here we can see the results in the most recent PR using election in New Zealand, where uh, the results are very close to, to good proportionality. Uh, so as you can see, a uh, very slight difference between uh, the national party's uh, popular vote and their uh, percentage of the seats, uh, same with, with Labour and, and some, of the, some of the smaller parties. Of course, the very smallest parties uh, have, been, have been left out because they do have a threshold for representation there of about 4%. Another claim uh, is around whether or not our legislatures uh, reflect the diversity of the society that they uh, operate within. Uh, so do they represent, obviously, on the one hand, ideological uh, diversity, but do they also represent demographic diversity? And so here we have some, some fairly recent results as of June 2018 uh, about the, the demographic representation, in this case, women. And uh, again, the evidence is fairly strong that um, PR systems, proportional systems, uh, represent uh, women uh, more effectively amongst Western countries than majority systems. Now, not completely, and you can see, of course, in France that they've made their way into the top five uh, of, of the countries, uh, but it took quite a bit more time than in the proportional systems. So we don't want to suggest that, say, first past the post or majority systems are absolute barriers to diversity, but rather how quickly do different voting systems uh, take up claims for diversity. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the results around indigenous representation in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, which has a, a very large indigenous population, but historically had fairly low representation using the first past the post voting system. But since the introduction of the PR system, quite dramatic improvements and, and fairly consistent uh, representation of the Maori in that country, which I think is an exciting development for British Columbia, because obviously British Columbia also has a very large indigenous population that is not well represented uh, in the legislature. Uh, turning to questions of voter turnout, we often hear this one, uh, and of course at the stark broad level, uh, the claims that PR systems uh, produce better voter turnout or higher voter turnout is true. Uh, so we can see uh, looking across these Western countries that uh, the PR countries are, are grouped around the highest turnout and the, the majority voting systems, first past the post and, and, and runoff systems near the bottom. Uh, now, there are some exceptions. Switzerland's a PR country, and it's near the bottom, uh, so it's not, again, absolute. Now, here, of course, we have to caution that there has been a drop-off in voter turnout across all Western industrialized countries. So even though uh, PR voting countries, on average, have higher voter turnout, it's not that they have been immune uh, to some of the challenges of getting voters out to vote. Uh, so we have to modify some of the claims. It, it, it seems reasonable the PR might improve voter turnout, but there are other factors beyond the voting system that affect that. Okay, let's turn into the question of majority government versus cooperation across parties. We've heard a lot of claims here. Uh, PR uh, supporters say that uh, PR will encourage cooperation across parties. Here we can see in looking at BC election results that um, very seldom have BC voters given one party a majority of the votes, the BC Liberals in 2001, uh, but almost always, barring 2017, has a minority of votes been able to turn into a majority of seats? So as you can see in the results there, um, uh, almost always a party has got less than a majority of the votes, but nonetheless has been able to secure a majority of the seats. So the idea that first past the post consistently produces legislative majorities for minorities is, is borne out by the facts. If we turn to the PR countries, again, here's an interesting comparison between the pre-MMP period in New Zealand and the post-MMP period in New Zealand. Um, in the case of uh, pre-MMP, uh, nearly always, in fact, always, uh, a majority of the votes were able to turn uh, that minority into a majority under first past the post. But since the introduction of MMP, a minority of votes has not been able to turn itself into a majority. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, what has occurred is cooperation across parties. So parties have had to work together to create a workable majority uh, and, and govern. So they've been able to affect a majority government that reflects uh, a majority of the voters, uh, in one case slightly less, or two cases slightly less, but in most cases a majority of the voters. All right, one of the claims that we've heard from the critics of, uh, of the NDP government's referendum uh, is that this is just all cooked up to allow the NDP and the Greens to stay in power forever. Um, I mean, it's an interesting claim uh, that, uh, that the system choice, uh, proportional system, is somehow biased in favor of the center-left rather than the center-right. 
Now, this, of course, assumes that the parties will stay the same and that the party choices will stay the same. If we look at what's actually happened in MMP using countries, uh, this doesn't appear to be what happens, right? If we look at countries that are comparable to Canada or to British Columbia, like New Zealand or, um, uh, or Germany, both using mixed member proportional voting systems, what we find is that there has been fairly consistent alternation in government. Uh, and so there you can see the details of how the center right was in power for a time in Germany, then the center left was in power, then the center right. And uh, what's interesting in, in, in Germany is that some of the center parties have changed their minds about who they want to work with, sometimes working with the left, sometimes working with the right, depending on the way the, the political winds were blowing. Uh, same with New Zealand. We see that the center right has had some time in power. We see the center left has had in power. So at least looking at what, other, what has happened in other countries, it doesn't appear to be true to say that the MMP voting system necessarily privileges any particular coalition of voters. Now, if we switch our attention to British Columbia, a very different image emerges. And instead, what we see under first past the post is that it has tended to privilege the center right. In fact, out of 24 elections since the emergence of a competitive left party in BC in 1933, 20 have been won by the right, only four by the left. So if your concern is alternation in government, if your concern is that um, we should see a regular shift between left and right, if that sort of follows what voters want, um, then the MMP system appears to do that while first past the post does not. What about governing instability? We, we've heard uh, many claims that a PR system will lead to instability. Uh, I mean, nobody's for instability. Instability sounds bad. Um, and so how would we measure such a thing? How would we make that claim about instability have any evidence to back it up? Well, one of the ways that we could look at it was to look at whether or not countries with PR have had any more elections. I mean, after all, if a country can't establish a, a stable government, we would expect them to have to go back to the polls more often to get some input from the public. When we look at the number of elections uh, since 1945, comparing uh, PR and, um, and non-PR countries, what we discover is that, in fact, in most cases, uh, PR countries have had fewer elections than the first-past-the-post countries, uh, and, and you know, including British Columbia in this list. Uh, so Germany, Italy, even Israel, which is often held up as a poster child of instability. And in many ways, it's just not comparable to Canada or British Columbia because of the unique circumstances there. But nonetheless, despite complaints of instability, they have had fewer elections uh, than uh, British Columbia or Canada in the same period of time, which suggests that the instability is not so great that they can't somehow work it out without going to the electorate uh, to get more instructions. Another way that we could look at instability is to look at whether or not the agreements that are made between parties to govern together somehow break down. Again, this is the idea that coalition government is less stable than a single party majority government. Uh, and so, you know, if we would see these agreements break up, uh, then we would expect to see, uh, you know, then we would maybe think that they are unstable. Uh, and so in looking at the agreements that have been made in New Zealand, and these are agreements from the center to the right or agreements between the center and the left, and uh, all of those agreements have been signed and none of them have broken down uh, since the time that they adopted MMP. So again, this suggests that um, the claims of instability are, are not really backed up by any, any facts. What about voter complexity? Uh, one of the claims that we've heard is that the uh, different voting system other than the first past the post could confuse voters. Uh, the voters, uh, you know, would find this too hard to use. They wouldn't know how to mark their ballots. They wouldn't understand how a government is formed. Again, there is some evidence that we can turn to to try to assess whether or not these claims are true. Are our PR systems too hard for voters to use? One of the things we can do is look at what occurs in PR using countries around spoilt ballots. You know, if voters go and they make some mistakes because the ballots are too hard, we would expect the spoilt ballot count to be higher in countries with more complex voting systems. But when we look at the results of ballot spoilage across Western countries, what we find is that the differences are relatively insignificant. In other words, it doesn't appear that voters using PR voting systems are having any more trouble marking their ballots than voters who are using uh, first-past-the-post voting systems. And depending, of course, on which elections we're looking at, we may find uh, some higher results in the plurality systems. We may find some lower results in the PR systems. But averaging across time, uh, everybody seems to fall within a fairly acceptable level of spoiled ballots, uh, barring you know, particular unusual circumstances. 
All right. Well, my goodness, I can't believe I got through all of my uh, all of my slides uh, under 12 minutes. Well, three minutes to spare. So that leaves us even more time to discuss the things that you want to discuss uh, as the uh, as the viewers of this webinar. Thank you, Dennis. It is refreshing and informing to hear, you know, the comparative evidence because in a debate like the one we have on electoral reform, there are many misconceptions, and it is a highly political debate in nature, right? So uh, to look at evidence from other countries, I think, is, is a great way to put our own jurisdiction and what we do here into perspective. So thank you very much, uh, Dennis. We're going to have you on in, uh, after uh, Max Cameron's uh, presentation uh, for the discussion. So this gives me the opportunity to slide over to our next speaker, um, is, who is Maxwell Cameron, who is the director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He has been greatly involved um, in public debates around a variety of democratic reform initiatives, including Senate reform, parliamentary reform, and electoral reform. You know, his primary concern in terms of research is the quality of democracy more, more broadly, and then he puts, you know, uh, the focus, the analytical focus on, um, on these kind of reforms in terms of facilitating and improving the quality of democratic life. Um, his most recent book, um, Political Institutions and, and Practical Wisdom, focuses on the skills and knowledge citizens and um, state persons need to participate in democratic politics. In 2016, um, Cameron was awarded the Social Science and Humanities Research Council Connections Grant to convene a national roundtable um, on electoral reforms. And he made submissions to the Electoral Reform Committee of the House of Commons. Um, in, in February of 2018, he participated in a public forum on electoral reform in a workshop organized by the BC Symposium on Proportional Representation, which led to a submission to the Office of the Attorney General. Cameron is the co-founder and organizer of an annual Summer Institute for Future Legislators, a program designed to prepare people for public office. And with this distinguished um, biographical note and uh, reflection of the expertise uh, that Max Cameron has, I would like to invite Max to join us here now uh, virtually and move into his presentation. So Max, if you could Enable your camera, please. Oh, that seems to be working fine. Wonderful. So I step into the background and leave the floor to you, Max. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you uh, for the invitation to, uh, to be with you. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure to have this opportunity, and I'm uh, delighted to follow uh, Dennis's her presentation. I think Dennis has done uh, just uh, terrific work in this area, which has been so important uh, uh, for uh, enriching the public debate. Um, what I'd like to do uh, today, I think, is to is to build on what uh, Dennis has started uh, and focus the discussion uh, uh, specifically on the situation uh, that we find ourselves in uh, in in British Columbia. So um, I'm going to go to the first slide. Um, We've been given a choice in British Columbia uh, to choose whether we wish to um, retain our current first-past-the-post system uh, or to move towards some system of proportional representation. So you can see uh, on your screen there the ballot. I just received mine uh, last night and, and very excited to, to fill it out. And as you can see, there are two questions. The first question is, do we want um, to keep first past the post, or do we want a proportional representation voting system? Uh, and then the second question is, which of three different systems would the uh, voters of British Columbia prefer uh, were we to move to a proportional representation system? I'm, I'm going to begin by just um, building on what Dennis has said, highlight a couple of the major differences between uh, first past the post and proportional representation. And I want to argue that these two different electoral systems um, are based on quite distinctive visions of democracy, that they're really quite different notions of what democracy is all about. 
Uh, and um, I, I then want to go through uh, each of the different systems that are on the ballot. And I want to suggest that each of them represents, in some sense, an effort to find a compromise or a blend of both the current system and a more proportional system. So the system that you see now on your screen, um, I want to first begin with just first past the post. Um, uh, the image there is the ballot that we typically uh, are accustomed to seeing when we walk into the polling station to vote. Um, we mark an X uh, beside the candidate of our choice. And the candidate uh, who wins the largest number of votes carries the seat. So this is called a winner-take-all system. Uh, whoever wins the most votes carries that seat. And of course, what that means is that the votes that um, were not for the winning candidate don't then count toward the representation of other political parties. So the admirable simplicity of this system uh, at one level uh, creates another problem. And that is that it is entirely possible within first past the post uh, for uh, a party uh, to win a plurality of the vote across many ridings. That won't necessarily add up to uh, over half of the votes uh, in, the, in the election, but can very well lead to more than half of the seats being won by that party. This is often referred to as a false majority government. And uh, people who are concerned with first past the post and believe that it does not provide good representation will stress that what that leads to are single party governments, uh, which often have a, a fairly narrow base that can govern with relatively little hindrance from the opposition. They don't have to work together in the legislature. Uh, to form government, as we saw in the PR systems that, that Dennis was talking about. So um, uh, the idea of first past the post, I think, really resonates with people in, in, in Canada who really think that democracy is fundamentally better when we have clear, decisive electoral outcomes, um, <clears throat> which allow for the uh, formation of governments that have a strong mandate and that can govern as they wish for a period of time, at the end of which voters have the opportunity to throw the bums out if they don't like what they've done, uh, or to reward them if they do uh, with another term in office. Uh, so I think the idea of first past the post really appeals to a notion of democracy as a system of the construction of mandates and of kind of accountability. That, that that sort of single party government provides. That I think is how people who like first past the post tend to think about democracy. And I, I've certainly encountered this a lot in my conversations with people over the past few months as we discuss changing our electoral system. But that vision of democracy is quite different from what I think animates those who support proportional representation. So the idea of proportional representation, very simply, is that the share of the popular vote that uh, party uh, gets should be reflected in the share of seats that it wins in the legislature. Now, of course, that fairness, that inherent fairness uh, of, of proportionality uh, comes also at a cost. Uh, in order to get it, you need somewhat larger districts, and, and you, do, you may require um, more complicated formulas for, for translating votes uh, into, into seats. Um, so um, this is uh, this is a, a, a different understanding of, of democracy. I think people who support proportional representation tend to like it because they really believe that uh, elections should be fair, that every vote that's cast, even if it doesn't go for a winning candidate, should go into a pool of votes that uh, influences the overall representation in the legislature. And, and that way, we get better, fairer, more accurate representation of the diverse viewpoints in our society. Um, and, and there's a kind of an expectation that parties will work together to form government uh, and to implement policies that reflect not just the potentially narrow base of a plurality winner, but actually a, a broader base of a, of, a, of a democratic government. And so that leads to a very different kind of stability. I think uh, Dennis rightly, rightly suggested that there's a debate about whether single party majority governments are more stable and 
uh, I think it really depends on how you define stability. Uh, if, you, if you mean by stability uh, the construction of a consensus that often tends to be relatively enduring and that allows you to get things done over a period of time, in fact, proportional representation creates more stable government, contrary to what uh, advocates of first past the post say. Okay, so how do we, how do we accomplish some kind of uh, proportionality in our system? Um, what I want to do is now walk through the systems, and you can see on your slide there the first one. We'll start with the first one that's on the ballot, and we'll go through them. Uh, they're listed on the ballot uh, alphabetically, but, but, but uh, co coincidentally, uh, they're also listed from the system that in some sense is most like our current system uh, to the system that is least like our current system. So, so let's begin then with dual member proportional. So what happens with dual member uh, proportional? is that we would couple up writings. We would combine two adjacent writings throughout the province. This wouldn't happen to all writings. Some large rural writings would be left as they are. Uh, but we would combine writings, so we would now have writings that are twice as large but are represented by two MLAs. So the ratio of voters to MLAs remains the same. The parties then would be um, given the option of running one or two candidates in uh, each writing, a primary candidate and a secondary candidate. And voters, when they go into the polling station, would see a ballot that, as you can see there on your screen, looks a good deal like the ballot that we have in our current first-past-the-post system. In other words, you get to mark one X beside the party and the potentially two candidates, or the independent, because independents can also, of course, run in the system, um, that the voter prefers. Now, what happens is, the primary, the votes are counted, and the primary candidate, um, the party that wins the largest number of votes, is elected to the first seat. The second seat is then going to be allocated on the basis of proportional representation. In other words, you will look at the overall performance uh, of that party in terms of its vote share. You would then calculate how many seats it should have based on proportionality. And then if there is a deficit, if there is a gap between the number of seats that were won on a plurality basis and the number of seats that the party should have based on its total vote share, um, you would then add seats to that party going from those ridings in which the party has done the best uh, first uh, until you've uh, filled the, the, uh, the number of seats that the party should have. So that, that in, a, in essence, is... Uh, the way that dual member proportional works. And as you can see, the ballot looks like uh, first past the post. Um, so it's, it, it retains relatively small riding. So there's good local representation, something that people who advocate for first past the post want. But it also achieves a high level of proportionality. So that's the first system. The, the second system uh, is called mixed member proportional. And uh, this is really the German system. It was the system designed in Germany in 1949, but it's been adopted in other parts of the world. It's been adopted most recently uh, by New Zealand, um, and, uh, but it's also used in, in Scotland and, and, and in other jurisdictions. Uh, and in the mixed member proportional system, you have two different types of MLAs. There are district MLAs who are elected to represent uh, a particular electoral district or riding. Uh, and they're chosen based on first-past-the-post. So again, we retain a first-past-the-post element. If you look at your screen under district vote, you can see that that's very much like the kind of ballot that we currently have. But at least in the, this example, which is taken from the Elections BC website, uh, voters would actually have two votes. In addition to voting for their district candidate, uh, they would also have a party vote. And the party vote, what then gives us a sense of the overall support for the political party across the entire jurisdiction, across, in this case, British Columbia. Um, and then um, the um, electoral maps would be drawn in such a way that there would be regions, and thus regional MLAs. These would be combinations of electoral districts where parties would then present lists of candidates. Um, and then once we know the vote, the party vote, we would then be able to uh, assign uh, uh, the uh, MLAs to these uh, regional groupings on a proportional basis. And so again, you get in this system, it's a mix of first past the post with 
um, proportional representation, a district vote and a party vote. And it gets us closer. It doesn't always necessarily get perfect proportionality, but a good deal better than uh, our, our uh, current system. And the final system that's on the ballot, and this is the one that in some sense is, uh, I suppose, the, the, the most complex, um, and perhaps the system that is most unlike uh, our current system is rural-urban uh, proportional. So um, rural, rural urban proportional, if we can just move to the, to the next uh, slide there, um, starts with MMP. So we will still have um, MMP in the rural parts of the province. But the difference here is that in addition, we would have the single transferable vote in the urban areas. This was the system that was recommended by the Citizens Assembly of British Columbia over a decade ago. Um, and the way that STV works uh, is um, that we create multi-member uh, ridings. So we need larger ridings, probably somewhere between two and seven MLAs uh, per, per riding. Um, voters then would see a ballot like this. Now, this is a little bit more unfamiliar to voters in, in British Columbia. Um, where they get to rank their preferred uh, candidates. Uh, and they, rather than just marking an X on your ballot, you would actually be able to put a number. You put the number beside the candidate that you like the most. Uh, number number one would be that for that candidate. Number two would be for your next preferred candidate. Number three and so forth. And you can rank as many as you like. Now, the, the, the uh, interesting feature of this system is that you can, of course, then and choose among candidates in different slates. You could put all of your votes uh, and rank only candidates from the party that you most identify with, or you can split your ballot and vote for candidates from different political parties. So it gives it really gives voters a good deal of choice. Now, the way that the votes are, votes are then counted is there are several rounds of counting. Um, you, uh, quota is set in terms of the number of votes you need in order to win a seat. That's based on the size of the district uh, and the number of candidates. Um, and, and then you would add up all of the first preferences of, of the, the voters. And if a candidate has crossed that threshold or that quota, then any additional or surplus uh, votes would be redistributed to other candidates based upon uh, the uh, second, uh, third, and fourth preferences and so forth of, of, of uh, of each of the voters. And you would do that iteratively until you filled the quota. Uh, you might also take the smaller candidates, the ones who have uh, not got anywhere near the threshold, and if they are dropped off the ballot, their votes are redistributed as well. Uh, and this, uh, this is done, as I said, iteratively until uh, all of the seats in that, uh, in that riding are filled. So as you can see, this is a system that really gives voters uh, a, a good deal of choice. Um, uh, it is the system that uh, perhaps uh, parties tend not to like quite so much because they can uh, present their candidates, but voters get to sort of choose which ones they, they support the most. Now, we face then, uh, to, just to, to, to conclude with a couple of final observations, we really face a, a choice in, in British Columbia. These are the, these are the three different systems that are, that are on the ballot. Uh, it's worth noting, and maybe I'll just go back up if we could to the uh, to the very first slide with the original ballot that we have. Um, you can choose to support PR or first pass the post and not indicate which of the preferred systems uh, of PR that you would would like. Um, similarly, um, you know, even if you you know if you don't like um, proportional representation, you can still rank the PR systems to indicate which of them you consider, uh, I suppose, uh, least objectionable. Um, so these are quite independent questions. And the, the point is to, first of all, get a very clear mandate uh, with respect to whether people want change, and then to get some guidance from the public in terms of if we do want change, well, more than 50% of the people uh, who vote, uh, in fact, want to change what type of system we would want. Um, why are we considering systems that uh, have not been uh, tested? Uh, people have raised this question, dual member proportional, it's true, uh, is a new system. It was uh, invented by Sean Graham, a graduate student at the University of Alberta. Um, 
uh, and, and some people say, well, why are we, why are we even contemplating systems? It's never been tried anywhere else. Rural urban PR. Uh, it's a combination of familiar systems, but it's a new combination of them. And I think that the reason for that um, is that um, there's, if we are going to change our electoral system, we don't, we should not feel locked into uh, adopting the same, same systems that other countries have if we can think of ways of improving them. And I'd like to quote Arendt Leipart, a very distinguished scholar um, who, of, of electoral systems, who says, both parliamentarism and PR can be fine-tuned to fit the conditions of particular countries and also to allay the, any fears that the combination of PR and parliamentary government will lead to weak and unstable cabinets, however exaggerated those fears may be. And again, I think that part of what these systems are, are trying to do is precisely uh, to find a combination that fits our unique geography and our political culture by keeping uh, a, a substantial uh, element of um, local representation and, and plurality while at the same time injecting an element of, of proportionality uh, into our, our system. And I don't think that there's any, you know, we, you look at um, the, the kind of the, the uh, we certainly don't want a pure PR system like some countries in, in Europe have, um, in which um, there is the real potential for fragmentation uh, of, our, of our party system and, and where you would potentially um, have difficulties with the construction of government. I think that the systems that are on the ballot uh, are not examples of, of pure PR. They're really examples of, of compromises that combine PR with, with first past the post. Um, the second point I also want to just, I think, really reiterate and, and, and reinforce what uh, Dennis has said about the complexity of these systems. Um, the way I think about it is the question here isn't can voters understand the potentially complex formulas that are used to translate votes into seats. Uh, th that's not an important question. Nobody's going to be have, nobody, in, in, no voters are, are going to be required to do those calculations. Um, what they need to understand is the ballots. Can they read the ballots? Can they understand the choices that are open to them? Can they make meaningful democratic choices? Can they do it in a way that's consistent with their preferences and that will contribute to the formation of the kind of governments that they want? And I think there's no question that they can. In fact, if you look at the literature uh, on um, satisfaction with, with voting systems, what you find, and I'll, I'll quote from, from a study, is that voters in majoritarian systems are more likely to consider their ballots um, to be unfair. In other words, people in first past the post find their systems unfair. People in PR systems consider their um, votes to be fair, and they have confidence in the conduct of their elections. PR systems are rated more highly by voters uh, vote, uh, are rated more highly by voters than in majoritarian uh, systems. Um, I'll, I'll end with a final quote. This is Robert Dahl, one of my favorite uh, democratic theorists. So I think really kind of captures a bit of the spirit of the current debate that we're having in BC. Uh, he said, to citizens of a country where only two political parties contest elections, like BC, uh, a country with a multiplicity of parties may look like political chaos. To citizens in a multi-party country having only two parties to choose from may look like a political straitjacket. If either were to examine the other country's party systems, they might find the differences even more confusing. I think that's sort of the world we're in where um, we're used to something and we're looking at another kind of system, and so we're being told quite tendentiously that these systems are chaotic and they are, are unstable and so forth, and when we look at them, they seem very unfamiliar to us. Um, just as if people from those systems look at ours, they would find it baffling that we would limit our choices in the way in which we do. But I think if we uh, try a, a PR system, um, we will probably find uh, that we like it well, and note that we do have a choice, uh, which is to um, uh, in a, after two electoral cycles, will there be another referendum? If we don't like PR, we can revert back to the status quo. Uh, my guess would be that's not what we would do, but that is, I think, something that should give some assurance to voters who may be nervous about making a change. So I think I'll stop there. I think I've used up more than my time uh, and look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max, walking us through the details of the different options we have. and. Um, in a way, you know, though many people don't know the details and, you know, some might be confused, you know, it is some very fundamental and pretty straightforward choices we have to make when it comes to these electoral systems. And they tie in with, you know, the broader debate about the quality of our democratic decision making um, and, you know, the options that we as citizens have. So at this stage, could I ask um, Dennis to join us again and uh, activate his video? Pete? Hello. Wonderful. Hello. There, there you are. Um, 
So maybe you know we have already a couple of questions. There's one uh, from uh, from a participant who can only rejoin us at after 10:30 about transition period. But you know maybe we we shelve this for the moment. Okay, um, we um, what we could do is uh, to uh, to go to a very straightforward one um, that st speaks to just where Max uh, left us off. Um, Joey Walsh asked, what if I choose PR and rank the system that doesn't get a majority, will my vote be invalid, you know, on the, on the ballot sheet, right? Or, or you know, the, also, if we just answer the first one uh, and not rank the system, you know, the three systems in the end, it, does it invalidate um, a ballot? Or can we just go for the first uh, choice? No, they're two independent systems. They're completely uh, separate questions, and that was deliberate. It's the same ballot that people in New Zealand got when they moved toward changing their system. The first question is, do you want uh, to keep the status quo first-past-the-post system, or do you want to move toward a system of proportional representation? That's the critical question. If over 50% of the voters support that, then there will be change. The second question is really about giving guidance to the government. Uh, as to which of the three systems on the ballot we should move toward if the majority wants a new electoral system. If the majority does not want a new electoral system, then the rankings on the second question are kind of irrelevant. Uh, that The matter will be moot. Um, you can uh, say what you wish on the first question, pro or, or against PR, regardless of your position on that, however, you are entitled to vote on the second question. And that's very important because I'll tell you from what I have seen uh, of uh, some of the polling that's been done, people who favor first past the post tend to like of the PR systems dual member proportional more than any other for exactly the reasons that I just articulated. It's the system most similar to our current uh, uh, first past the post system. Whereas people who like uh, proportional representation in principle and don't like the first past the post system, they tend to favor uh, a mixed member proportional or MMP. So I think that in some sense, there could be an interesting contest in that second ballot um, between those, those two systems. Of course, there are also uh, supporters of, of rural urban for, for and, and, and you know, that's, a, that's a valid option as well. So it, it is important, I think, if you've got a view of, the, of, of which of those systems you like to cast your ballot on the second part, but it's really the first part of the ballot that's going to drive whether, in fact, we move toward a different system. Yeah, I, Dennis, just, do you want to come in? Yeah, I would just add that uh, what's interesting about the ballot is that even if voters vote no, uh, like even if they vote, you know, to keep first past the post, they're still entitled to register a preference on the PR systems. And I think this was a very interesting move by the government to say, well, you know, if PR wins and you don't like PR, well, then which is the one you can live with uh, to the people who, who would prefer to stay with first past the post? So it's, it's a very sophisticated ballot in terms of allowing voters to have a lot of say over what ultimately happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now moving slightly away from the actual ballot and the process here in BC, um, coming to some of the, you know, the issues raised by, by Dennis in his presentation. One is what about, you know, given the current environment we live in, uh, wouldn't PR, the PR system, encourage and in a way uh, propel fringe, lunatic fringe parties, as you know, one of our participants uh, framed it, to more success? So what we see at the moment with um, far right, uh, some of them anti-democratic parties, you know, coming to parliament uh, and, and having success all across in the European context, um, do we open the door to these kind of fringe parties by, uh, with a PR system, and I think there was a follow-up question to say the different PR systems is one better than the other in terms of controlling the rise of fringe parties from the extreme left or extreme right um, in this respect. Who wants to take this? Well, I mean, I can speak to, you know, some of the research that's been done on the rise of, you know, so-called extremist parties. I mean, we have to recognize that, you know, this is a political statement itself. I mean, I think there are some parties that we could all agree are fairly extreme, neo-Nazi parties, for instance. Um, but, you know, other parties may just have views that other voters don't agree with and thus get labeled extreme. Um, but what has been the experience in Europe is that when, uh, for instance, say, neo-fascist, neo-Nazi parties have emerged in uh, PR countries, 
um, yeah, they've, they've emerged. And then uh, other parties typically won't work with them, uh, recognizing that they may be punished by their own voters for cooperating with those parties. And what happens is that the support for those parties diminishes as voters uh, try to get things done, right? This is part of the skewed aspect of this debate is that there's a sort of an assumption that these extremist parties are so exciting and tantalizing that voters will rush to embrace them. You know, at the end of the day, voters want to get stuff done. And part of the reason that you see different kinds of party systems in PR systems is that voters have different ideas about how to do that. Some of them do it by concentrating on just a few parties. Some PR, PR systems have very few parties, Austria, for example. Um, others have many parties, but those parties have a long history of working together and, and putting together effective governing coalitions. Um, in terms of the options on the ballot, I'm sure you know, Max can speak to this a bit more, uh, but the ones that are being offered in BC all have either explicit or implicit thresholds that would be applied to them. So either a four or 5% threshold, which would basically say that if you're a really small bunch of people and you don't have many people agreeing with you, you're not gonna get in the legislature. You know, 5% of the votes in a BC election is a lot of votes. Um, and so if a party's getting over that amount, you're talking about you know, cutting a lot of people out of representation. Whereas systems like the single transferable vote have an implicit threshold because there's a limit to the number of people who can be elected, uh, let's say five people to be elected, then the threshold is going to be usually in, a, in an STV system 17 to 20% of the vote you've got to get in terms of being able to get into the parliament. So yeah, I, I, I think these concerns are overstated. Uh, I don't think that any of the systems necessarily empower of, of, you know, extremist parties. Uh, I think they, the experience from Europe suggests that um, the beauty of PR is that it, it represents what people say and no more. Whereas the danger of first past the post is that once extremism becomes a part of a, of, of a larger party, it can be dramatically overrepresented, as we saw with Donald Trump, as some would argue is happening in Ontario, uh, lots of different uh, discussion about what extremism means and how it gets into the governing benches. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I would you agree with that. And I'd also think it's worth uh, differentiating the different kind, kinds of extremists that, uh, that we're potentially up against. There's a, uh, an interesting literature emerging on this in, in Europe. So for example, I would say that um, we should distinguish between populists, uh, nativists and, and neo-Nazi. So, you know, small neo-Nazi fringe parties, uh, anti-system parties are actually very, in very few cases in Europe, have any weight whatsoever. And as Dennis pointed out, even when they do get representation, they're largely shunned by the mainstream parties. The, the system doesn't really let them have much influence. Um, large populist parties, which we've seen in Hungary and Poland, but also in the United States, and frankly, I think if we look at what's happening in Ontario, we could consider those to be sort of right-wing populist uh, experiences, those are, um, pop, those, are, those are candidates that are winning large shares of the vote. They're going to gain representation under any electoral system. I think what we need to be concerned about are in between those options are the nativists, which are parties that are fundamentally anti-immigrant parties. Um, you know, Sweden Democrats, for example, um, which got uh, almost 20% of the vote uh, in the last election in Sweden. So there is a kind of a, kind of a potential risk that anti-immigrant parties can gain enough representation to be influential in terms of the kind of coalition dynamics that form governments and PR systems. My view of this, however, is that the reason why we're seeing those kinds of parties emerge in Europe is because Europe is experiencing the greatest wave of mass migration since the Second World War into countries that have well-developed, partly because of their PR systems, well-developed welfare states. And that creates, I think, a real potential tension. Uh, it's not surprising to me that there is a response to that. That that response gets political representation doesn't worry me, quite on the contrary. I think if there is concern about immigration enough to actually fuel the emergence of new political parties, those parties should be given representation because those issues should be worked out in the political system. Uh, I, I really uh, think that the notion that somehow uh, we can sweep dissent under the rug in, or into uh, big tent parties, I think, is, is, a, is you know, a, a, a huge mistake. And, and the reality is that the, it's the dynamics of first past the post that are polarizing that, and that create a highly adversarial kind of politics in which angry populism actually thrives. We somehow seem to have persuaded ourselves that we are an island of stability. I don't think the people in Euro Northern European countries that look at British Columbia over the last two or three decades would say, well, that's an incredibly stable jurisdiction. Quite on the contrary, we're the kind of place in this country, and we've seen this in Ontario, we've seen this federally, we've seen this in BC, 
where you get a one party which has 40% of the vote moving down a track with very little support uh, beyond that base, implementing policies that then when the next government comes in and you get these sort of wild swings from left to right, then dismisses everything the previous government has done and moves in a whole different track, which means that we don't actually get traction on major issues, whether it's um, climate change policy, whether it's reconciliation with, with First Nations. We actually don't make forward progress on those kinds of things, precisely because our political system doesn't encourage consensus building uh, and, and convergence on the center. So I, I really think that the argument that PR is going to make us more prone to instability um, is, is frankly misleading. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another you know, question on some of the criticisms we hear out there. Uh, uh, this, you know, let me read this. There's criticism that the three PR systems offered on the ballot favor the party over the candidate in a way that gives parties too much power. Is this a valid criticism or is it uh, over exaggerated? So, you know, the, the ability of the party to put together the, the list of candidates, you know, over the individual candidate running in one constituency. Well, again, I mean, if we look at comparative experience, you know, different countries have taken up this challenge in different ways. Um, different countries have different rules about how parties have to construct their lists. In New Zealand, there was an explicit law that said that parties had to have a transparent and open process of democratic nomination and selection within their parties. Um, uh, other countries haven't done that, but the parties themselves have competed against each other at different points to demonstrate to the public that they are operating in a democratic way. Uh, so again, I mean, you know, we can look at um, the kind of control that party leaders have in the Canadian context. I mean, at the federal level, if a party leader won't sign off on the nomination papers of a local candidate, that candidate's not running for that party. Um, oh, a leader in a, in a Canadian national party can parachute candidates in to a local riding. There's nothing a local riding can do about it. Um, so there's lots of ways in which these claims about parties being more or less powerful in these different systems is really quite false. Parties are powerful in all systems because it's hard for voters to figure out what's going on with a bunch of candidates who are, all seem to be different. Uh, and that's often why we see voter turnout much lower in electoral contests where there aren't political parties, like, say, local elections. Uh, it's just the information that voters need to make decisions is too hard. That's why they turn to parties. They turn to parties as an information shortcut. So I don't think there's evidence that uh, PR systems are, are any worse. In fact, I think there's evidence that they're better uh, in allowing voters to influence the behavior of parties. Yeah, I would just add to that, that it's really important that people understand it is just simply false to argue, as has unfortunately been argued, that under PR, the parties will be choosing who gets to be an MLA, not the voters. At the end of the day, these are electoral systems. These are ways in which people vote, and their votes are translated into seats. No party boss or backroom uh, apparatchik is going to be deciding who gets into the legislature. Uh, it's going to be voters who make that decision. What parties do do uh, is they nominate candidates, and they run candidates, and they organize elections. Uh, and that's true under both systems. I think it is important to distinguish between the way in which these systems do this. So for example, one of the debates uh, around mixed member proportional is whether the lists that parties present for the different regional candidates is open or closed. If it's a closed list, you vote for the party list. If it's an open one, you can actually indicate which candidate you would prefer on those lists. Um, that's something that remains undecided. Now, a lot of people in the pro-PR camp uh, tend to favor open lists, and I think that's partly because they assume that voters will prefer it because it gives them more choice precisely uh, with respect to uh, this question of who gets into the legislature. Is it, is it a party list or is it the voter uh, choosing among candidates that, that, that drives that? Um, uh, in fact, there's also good arguments for closed lists. You're more likely to get better diversity under closed lists. You can have closed lists, and as Dennis just pointed out, have candidates democratically selected, uh, as happens in New Zealand, but also in, in Scotland. In SPV, that's really the one system where uh, I think you could say quite unequivocally, the parties actually, in some sense, uh, are given, are disempowered relative to voters, because their voters can clearly choose the candidates they want and, and split their vote across different tickets. So that's the only system that, that allows that. 
But I think it's I think the, like, the fundamental point here is your vote is going to be as important as it ever was in, in terms of deciding who gets elected. None of these systems are about taking choice away from voters. Let me add one question that, that gets at this very similar issue here. Um, one of our participants says, it seems to me that MMP could potentially lead to a mild level of corruption where regional candidates are selected by party officials based on favorite status within a party as opposed to the ability or quality of the candidate. What is the evidence uh, on this from other countries that have MPP, MMP? Well, it's a very, very big question. Um, again, one can look at the um, at countries that use the systems to try to say, well, is this speculated concern a real concern? I mean, you know, you can think it, but is it, in fact, anything that occurs anywhere? Uh, and one of the ways you could look at that is to look at the way that the countries come up with their lists. If they have an internally democratic process, then one would have to demonstrate how that's being jimmied or fixed or somehow overridden by the people who get to make those decisions. Um, part of the reason that we look at the quality of decision-making differently in first past the post than PR is because of the level of transparency over executive decision-making. In first past the post, because a party can win total control over the executive with just 40% of the vote, it means that they can basically hide everything they're doing until the time comes for another election. Uh, that's led to some really bad decisions, particularly in British Columbia, if we think of fast ferries or the sale of BC Rail or the recent looting of ICBC. Uh, there's lots of cases where if there'd been some other eyes on the books, maybe those decisions might not have been made. And you don't have to think you know, very hard in terms of game theory uh, to understand that if you've got a coalition government, if you've got more than one party involved, then the risks to those parties of covering up corruption is very, very high because they have to be able to absolutely trust a coalition partner who in many ways, of course, is also competing with them for, for public support. I think that's the best way to deal with possible issues of corruption. The more eyes we can keep on the governing process and decisions, the greater the safeguard to the public that there'll be less incentive to try to, you know, squirrel things away, push them under the rug. Whereas first past the post, on the other hand, creates incentives for parties um, to, well, if it doesn't create incentives, it certainly doesn't create disincentives um, because the, the, the potential there is for a government to be able to keep all of the details of its decision making under wraps, well, until they're forced out of power. I mean, even an election doesn't necessarily open the books. It's only when another party comes to power that suddenly we discover that all kinds of funny business was going on. Yeah, I would. I, that's a great answer, Dennis. I, I agree with you. And I, I think that um, I, I would, um, uh, and I've, I've done some work on Latin America. And, uh, you know, Latin America has some huge problems with sometimes with corruption in, in politics. And so I have seen examples where um, the competition for spots on a party list uh, produces corruption, where people are, are in fact driving their way onto choice positions on, on lists by offering money to the party that, uh, that nominates them. Uh, those are very serious issues. And in our system, uh, that kind of corruption would be considered criminal and, and would be penalized. Um, and, and so I think that I think it raises sort of a larger question of, of corruption. I, and my sense is that our system is has not been prone to that kind of corruption, uh, but it is true that our nomination processes are opaque. And whether we have electoral reform or not, it's probably worth taking a hard look at how parties nominate candidates uh, under the current system or any any alternative. The the other point I would want to add to this is we've got legislation now banning big money in politics, right? So uh, under the new legislation in BC. Um, large uh, uh, corporations, unions uh, uh, cannot uh, contribute, uh, only individuals and their caps on, on what they can contribute. And that came about as a result, I think, of having a minority parliament. It's, it's having two parties that are committed to electoral finance reform that, that brought that about. We had uh, 16 years of, of, of a party that was unwilling to act on this, even though it was clearly something that the electorate wanted, uh, but they were in a majority government position and so didn't have to negotiate. Uh, with the opposition and, and so felt little pressure to do that. It's only when you get a minority government that you get that kind of a pressures for, for accountability. And if uh, PR isn't adopted, I think uh, there's a very good chance that that legislation could be changed at the next election. So again, these things are in fact, I think, interconnected in these different ways.
Thank you, Meg. There's still some follow-up on the extremism uh, question, and uh, one is, you know, more specific on one country. I'm not sure you, you want to, you know, we have the expertise here, but uh, I still want to raise it. My sense of concern around this, and you know, I quote here one of our uh, participants, uh, comes in part uh, from a somewhat limited understanding of what is happening in Israel, where it is my view that very, uh, uh, very many parties, and relatively small parties with marginal views, uh, religious and so forth, control key policy areas through their small parts in coalition. Um, do different systems proposed leave such outcomes less or more likely? So we have a, a, a country where a, a relatively small country with, um, with, with strong religious views, let me put it like this, um, can control key policy areas. Can this be attributed you know, to the uh, different electoral systems uh, under discussion, and, and, and do, we, do we see a, a direct link here between a particular um, electoral system and outcomes such as the ones in Israel? Well, again, I, I think you know people are, are, are raising you know the classic questions, and it, it's important to face them head on. Um, and so, you know, people will often look to Israel. Uh, it gets a lot of press uh, as a country that uses a PR system and has a fairly robust internal debate about all sorts of issues that Israel is facing. Um, one of the things that I try to underline with people is that, you know, we often get the two extremes. Either voting systems do everything or they do nothing. Either they matter for everything or they matter for nothing. And the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, voting systems create facilitating conditions for political actions. They encourage or discourage uh, various kinds of choices, but they don't create them out of thin air. Uh, and so we have to make, when we do comparisons, we have to be careful to make comparisons uh, with countries that are comparable to the economic and historical experience of the place that we're looking at, in this case, British Columbia. Israel is obviously very different than British Columbia, has had a very different political history, faces very different political um, contexts. And so in that sense, I've often said to people, look, you can't really compare what happens in Israel uh, with British Columbia. In the same way that you couldn't say Zimbabwe, you know, things look pretty bad there, and they use first past the post. So I guess first past the post is bad. I mean, clearly that's a ridiculous argument. It's ridiculous because the conditions in Zimbabwe are so uniquely different than British Columbia that you can't hold the voting system as entirely account for what's happening there. And so, so true with Israel. Okay, just a couple of final things on Israel. Israel has one of the lowest thresholds to gain access to the political system. It used to be 1%. Uh, now it's, it's higher. Um, interestingly, though, the Netherlands has an even lower threshold. But we don't associate the kind of instability that we see in Israel uh, with the Netherlands. So there's no necessary relationship between the voting system and the party system or the kinds of political results that occur. Another interesting thing to think about is that for the first um, 45 years of Israel's history, they basically had a two-party system. Uh, basically, they had two large blocks, a conservative block and a, and a left-wing block, and, and they governed. In fact, for most of the post-war period up to the 1980s, one block governed, the labor block. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the things that we characterize uh, with PR in Israel were, were not true for a considerable amount of its history. In the 80s and 90s, it's only then that you started to see some of these religious parties emerge you started to see a breakdown of the older coalitions for reasons that are, are very interesting and complex, but can't entirely be blamed on the voting system. And of course, the obverse would be to suggest that if Israel changed its voting system, somehow these problems would go away. But I don't think that would be the case, because many of the, the groups that have the representation they do are geographically concentrated even within Israel. Um, so if you switch to a first-past-the-post system, there's no guarantee that you would necessarily make those problems go away. You know, my final thing on Israel is that, you know, whether, whatever people think about Israel or the situation in Israel, Israelis see themselves almost like a country at war. And when you have countries at war, they tend to have what we call maximum winning coalitions, right? In other words, you bring everybody in. And that was one of the reasons that they adopted proportional representation in the first place, was precisely to make sure that everybody in the country felt that they had a stake in the political system. So again, I, I think that there's some nuances here that people need to, to take account of. Yeah, I would just add to that, uh, you know, if you, you look at, say, the Netherlands, they have a single electoral district, 150 uh, uh, parliamentarians. You only need one 150th of the vote to, to carry a seat. So naturally, they have a large number of political parties and coalition formation is uh, a tricky business in, in, in the Netherlands. 
Um, that, their system is called List PR. That's not on the ballot. That's not one of the options. When the Attorney General began a process of consultation with British Columbians to see what kind of system they would like, that was one of the options that was tested. And what they heard back from both uh, people who made submissions to the government and people who responded to their polls was, that's kind of not the direction we want to go. I don't think anybody in Canada is proposing, uh, or anybody in British Columbia would propose that we would have a single electoral district that would be British Columbia, uh, and that we would then just have party lists to choose from, uh, which is what is actually the common system in Europe. That's why it's important that we have systems that are not tested, because the systems that are on the ballot are attempts to achieve a compromise between gaining the proportionality that we see in countries that are very well governed in, in Europe, while at the same time also retaining some of the features of the current system that we like, like strong local representation. I think we might actually overstate the value and importance of local representation. But be that as it may, the systems that are on the ballot are not systems like in Israel, not systems like uh, the Netherlands. These are systems that are really compromises between first past the post and PR. Thank you. And before we go uh, to a, the, our first question about transition periods, you know, one more, uh, it's more a remark, but I think it very much reflects what we just heard from the two of you. Um, and, I start, uh, and I'd read this now. Should not an electoral system match the history, geography, and political culture of the unit being represented? So what works for France may not be suitable for Sweden, and what works for BC may not be good for Nova Scotia. In other words, there's no one best system. In a way, what you've been doing over the past couple of minutes is to contextualize electoral uh, systems as well in pol particular political con context and, and uh, circumstances. Do you still want to add to this? You know, is there you know one best system that you know, irrespective of particular historic context, we, we could point out to, or it, it does it really depend on how it is being applied and what the historic and political circumstances under which these come to uh, to be used? Well, here, you know, I, I may have a slight difference with Max because you know he's put forward, I think, what is a fairly common view now, which is that you know first past the post and the PR systems represent different visions of democracy. Uh, and I can see why people say that. But again, taking up um, the comment about the history, when we look at the history of the struggle over different institutions, uh, it just doesn't bear scrutiny. Uh, first past the post was not adopted because it was a democratic system. It's a pre-democratic institution. Um, and the transition to democracy across all Western countries was fraught with conflict and bloodshed and struggle and inequality. And those things are, are, are exhibited in the institutional structures that, that we have. So, um, you know, is there a best system? No. Is there a worse system? Yes. Uh, I think that one of the ways we try to figure out what are people trying to do when they vote? What do we know about what people say they're trying to do? What do we see in their actions? And we do know quite a bit about what people uh, think they're doing and what they want to do. We know that people vote parties. Even when people say that they don't like parties, they still vote parties. Um, independents, people not collected with parties are very rarely elected. Um, and so then we have to ask ourselves, to what extent do our institutions facilitate what people are trying to do when they vote? And I think if we look at it that way, then first past the post fails miserably. Uh, it fails because it doesn't represent very well. Uh, it, it typically creates majority governments that don't reflect a majority of the people. Um, it's pretty lousy on reflecting uh, the demography of the country, the, the diversity. So yes, if we take, I would prefer that we take an historical approach to this. And I think if we look at the history, uh, I mean, particularly looking at the countries mentioned, Sweden and France, my goodness, I mean, France, France has changed its voting system more than any other country uh, combined. And, uh, and Sweden had a, a, a very uh, a taut uh, struggle over its voting system before World War I uh, that reflected not values, but a, a stark political struggle between, between left and right. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, they, um, the, the historically, if you if you sort of think about, you know, how in the 19th century there were a handful of democracies in the world. In fact, it's sort of debatable at what point you can say a country became a democracy. But if we sort of just take uh, sort of uh, you know universal male suffrage um, uh, as our as our as our baseline. Um, you know, in, in the 19th century, the countries that today are democracies all had first past the post. By the middle of the 20th century, most had shifted to proportional representation, and, and most of the new 
the emerging democracies have adopted proportional representation. And the way that that actually came about was in part, it was by consensus, they didn't have referenda for the most part. Normally what happened was proportion PR was adopted at the moment that the, uh, that the franchise was expanded. Um, and, and the reason was that elites worried that um, as labor became more important, the danger was that if um, uh, you gave a sort of labor government um, complete control over the government, uh, they would implement radical reforms that would threaten the interests of, uh, of, of, of private property. And so proportional representation was adopted to make sure that compromises and coalitions were, were necessary uh, to try to moderate um, the, the rise in power uh, of, of organized labor. So that's kind of interesting uh, to, to think that that, 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 was, that it was out of a concern for, for stability um, in the face of the emergence of labor that drove uh, the, the rise of PR uh, in, 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 in many cases. Um, and, and so, you know, what I'm interested in, in when I sort of think about the sort of visions of democracy kind of argument is it, it just, it really, it, it really is quite striking to me that uh, if you talk to people about um, why they support the current system, the arguments that you tend to hear again and again are, um, I like to think that at the end of the night uh, of voting, we know the result. And we talk about winners and losers, right? It's very commonplace that in our politics, we say, well, who won the election? We don't ask who commands the confidence of the legislature. We say, who got the most votes? And there's a kind of a presumption, whoever got the most votes should win, even if, in fact, our parliamentary system is not designed that way. Our parliamentary system is designed to confer power on those who can command the confidence of the legislature. Uh, but because we have false majority governments, we've kind of bought this idea that elections should be decisive. The day after, we should know who's going to form government. And that government should be in operation then until the next election. And I, I think part of what would be a kind of salutary tonic of PR for our politics would be to remind people that what, what we just went through in British Columbia is the kind of thing that would be pretty commonplace in the future. Is, that is to say, elections would take place. It would take a little bit longer for us to figure out what the, what the ballots actually said in terms of seats. And then there would be a process of, of coalition building and of bargaining and, and compromising to try to form government. And um, people say, well, that could take weeks or that could take months. In some countries, it's even taken years. Uh, Belgium, for example. Uh, now, I don't think that we would want coalition formation or government formation, coalition building to take that long. And I don't think it's likely in our system um, because I think, as Dennis rightly says, uh, there are a variety of things that explain why we have a more or less two-party system. Probably with PR, we would have maybe a three-party system. Um, uh, and, 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 and the electoral system is only part of it. Uh, but the, 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 the part of the appeal of um, having a system of proportional representation is that there would be that requirement that parties work together. And I don't think that we should think of that as something that is a distraction or that diminishes our democracy. In fact, I would say that process of coalition, of government formation and of coalition building is actually what par politics is all about. It's parties working together to figure out, okay, what's the common ground that we have? How can we work together? What is the agenda that we can confect out of the results of, of, of this, uh, this electoral process? Uh, and so no, there is no, there is no best electoral system. Absolutely, there's no expert consensus. Uh, this is not a decision that we get we're going to be able to make by sort of turning to um, Dennis or me or, or other political scientists, you know, you know, what is, what, you know, what a political scientist tells is the answer. Uh, on the contrary, this is a values question. It's about the way that we would like our democracy to work. What do we aspire to in our democracy? What do we like about it? How can we make it better? Those are, those are the questions we have to answer. And those are fundamentally questions about our, our values um, as, as much as they are really questions about how these systems work. We need to understand how they work. But we need to sort of try to make decisions based on how do the, our values map onto what the alternatives are uh, that, that we're, we're confronted with. I know, Fidel, we could definitely go on for, for much longer the fascinating discussion, but I definitely want to bring in uh, the question that came in first. This is about um, transition periods. Is there any research on how countries successfully transitioned into a PR system? 
And probably the, behind uh, is also the concern. Is it disruptive? You know, is it a smooth transition? Um, um, is there any evidence, you know, to, to move from one, probably the majoritarian first past the post system to a PR system can be quite disruptive in the political system? Well, any change in electoral laws offer an opportunity for voters to not know what's going on because the decisions are often made uh, in the government, the legislature, uh, you know, through elections, BC, for instance. Uh, I mean, I've been a, a deputy district electoral officer in British Columbia for two different elections, which meant that I was responsible for uh, organizing, uh, you know, teaching 300 people how to run their local area and hire out 17 locations. So I know a little bit about the administration. And BC at one point changed the names of the officers, which led to enormous confusion because elections often rely on volunteers who have done elections many, many times. And so the education of them is not as onerous because they're drawing on their experience and they help others in the voting location. And obviously political parties play a role here. So regardless of a change from PR from something else, any change in election administration requires the support to make it work. So, if you want to avoid increased ballot spoilage, uh, then you'll have to make sure that there is effective support for voters at the point of voting, which means hiring a few more people as information officers who can stand at the front, who can explain the options to voters, that can explain to them how to mark their ballots. And of course, this is normal, right? Election bodies will hold seminars for the political parties precisely so that they can help their voters because political parties, of course, play a key role in mobilizing voters into electoral activity and giving them direction. So the short answer is, does the transition represent a crisis or a problem? It could if a government doesn't take appropriate steps. However, if a government does take appropriate steps by investing in a little bit more election administration costs at the point of transition, then I don't think there's any reason that there should be a problem. Um, I would add to that that we have a precedent uh, for this kind of change, and that's, that's New Zealand, which in 1996 moved from first past the post to MMP. Um, and again, to quote uh, Aaron Leipart, who I mentioned earlier, um, he said, the first PR election instantly transformed New Zealand uh, in several respects, including a more proportional result, the development of a multi-party system, minority government, greater salience of ethnicity, and coalitions. And then um, Helen Clark, uh, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, was here in Vancouver uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, she said, uh, PR works because you've got a lot of consultations, you get more collaborative government with PR coalitions, the political culture changes, it takes a different skill set. Strong-minded autocratic leaders won't work in this system. So I think there's reason to believe that if you change the electoral system, um, you introduce a, a new element in terms of rules and incentives that can generate a different kind of behavior on the part of both uh, voters and politicians. But this is not automatic. Uh, you know, political scientists talk about the difference between sort of mechanical and psychological effects of electoral systems. We can say almost mechanically that we're less likely to have majority, single party majority governments or false majorities. Um, that's, that's in all likelihood uh, uh, an, an, an almost inevitable consequence uh, of electoral reform. What the psychological effects would be in terms of how politicians think about their work, uh, how they relate to voters, how voters uh, cast their ballots and so forth, uh, that, a lot of that is uh, hard, hard to predict, is unknowable, is, uh, is, is likely to occur over multiple electoral uh, cycles. And I have to say, I think both the people who expect a lot to come from electoral reform and those who fear that it's going to produce all sorts of dire consequences uh, are likely to find that electoral reform doesn't have quite the level of impact that they may be anticipating. All right, yeah, gentlemen, there are already things coming in. Yeah, I would like, love to thank our audience yeah, to stay with us. I hope you found this uh, a rewarding um, experience. But I think, you know, what we've heard from you that is a Max, that has been wonderful, you know, clearly, you know, with your expertise, you can enlighten us, and at times controversial and sometimes, you know, um, not, you know, so prominent public debate that clearly touches on central issues about the future of our democracy, its quality, and, and I would hope you could hear the applause in, uh, in the ether, you know, the internet, uh, but unfortunately webinar doesn't give you this sense, but I think um, our listeners share with me, you know, the great appreciation for your time and expertise has been Wonderful, thank you very much. And I hope the audience consider joining us on a different occasion for one of our future webinars. Thank you very much. And, and if I could just-
Oliver, I could just say quickly, I mean, I, we didn't answer all the questions that people have put forward, and I welcome people to contact me. You can see my email on the screen. Uh, Max's email is on the screen. So if you didn't get your question answered, some of them were pretty technical, uh, you know, feel free to contact us because I'm, I'm sure we'd be delighted to follow up these questions with you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much for this. And hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.